Beyond Good and Evil, Part 5, on the natural history of morals. Nietzsche begins by criticising the claim that there is a science of morals, which is the idea that moral truths can be uncovered via the use of reason. He does this for a few reasons. Firstly, in treating morality as a science, philosophers only succeed either in rationalising the morals imposed onto them externally by their environment, or in rationalising their own moral prejudices. They never venture out and look at other moral systems, and their search is never from a place of genuine inquiry. They only seek to confirm their current beliefs. Nietzsche writes in Aphorism 186, They knew the facts of morality, only as morality of their environment, their class, their church, the spirit of their times, their climate and zone of the earth. Next, Nietzsche makes the claim that some aspect of faith is needed to believe that these morals actually exist in the first place, so it can hardly be said to be a scientific pursuit if faith is the very first step that you need to take. He writes, What philosophers called the rational ground of morality and sought to furnish was, viewed in the proper light, only a scholarly form of faith in the prevailing morality, a new way of expressing it. Another problem which we already briefly touched upon is that one knows today what is good and evil. One already has too much certainty about the nature of morality. This blinds philosophers to other moral views and makes them stubborn and narrow-minded because they think that there is no need to radically examine and reevaluate their current ideas. Our problem is that we have a blind confidence in modern ideas. Another key idea is Nietzsche's view of morality as being something tyrannical, particularly something tyrannical over nature, as it is supposedly something unnatural and suppresses what is natural in man. Nietzsche expresses his emotivist stance in Aphorism 187, where he states that moralities too are only a sign language of the emotions. An emotivist stance means that one views moral guidelines not as expressing some fundamental truth, but rather as being merely a communication of personal likes and dislikes. So the moral principles that we arrive at are the result of our emotions, the irrational part of ourselves that we have little to no autonomy over. So they are not discovered as objective truths in the universe after a process of rational inquiry. Nietzsche's motivism is linked closely to his concept of the will to power as being the fundamental driver in human behaviour. This means that when one says X is good, this is equivalent to saying X heightens my sense of power. In other words, it is an expression of likes and dislikes. For example, Kant's morality based upon duty, obedience and suppression reveals his desire to forget himself as a being defined by the will to power. In other words, he doesn't like being defined by the will to power, so has to create a morality that allows him to define himself as being bound by something different, as being bound by the opposite. Because to accept that one is defined by the will to power is to accept that they are not bound by any overarching rules or principles and are free to embrace the instinctual and irrational sides of human nature. According to Nietzsche, Kant does not like this and thus his morality allows him to fulfil this need that he has. Another example is the Socratic method which, according to Nietzsche, is nothing more than a public exertion of one's will to power. We will talk more about Socrates later. Also, a quick distinction needs to be made about the will to power. Nietzsche thinks that it is the fundamental drive in humans, but there are two types. Firstly, the active will to power is adopted by masters. These are people that have the strength to create their own life-affirming values. However, the other type is adopted by people with a weak nature. The reactive will to power is not the source of its own values. Its moral framework comes only from denying the values created by the strong. Nietzsche writes, Every morality is a piece of tyranny against nature, likewise against reason. Nietzsche writes this because most moral guidelines suppress what is natural. They suppress the instincts and passions of man and this is damaging to the individual's ability to become great. Next, Nietzsche talks of morality as being a creative act 
So just reinforcing what we said earlier, philosophers know in advance what their morality is going to be. It is not arrived at after genuine inquiry and searching. Nietzsche states in Aphorism 188 that we suspect any thinker who wants to prove something that they always knew in advance that which was supposed to result from the most rigorous cogitation. He goes further and says that it is the premature hypothesis, the fictions, the good stupid will to believe, the lack of mistrust and patience which are evolved first. We filter what information we receive and respond only to that which is familiar and not too new or too radical. And with respect to morality as being a creative act and the moral philosopher as being an artist, he writes about them that we fabricate the greater part of the experience and can hardly be compelled not to contemplate some event as its inventor. All this means we are from the very heart and from the very first accustomed to lying or to express it more virtuously and hypocritically, in short, more pleasantly, one is much more of an artist than one realises. So it is our desire to see things and interpret them in a particular way that is much more powerful than the evidence that we receive from our senses. We formulate our conclusions before we deduce them and we construct what is not present, as if we were an artist creating a structure. This idea actually links closely to the next topic we're going to discuss, which is instinct versus reason. There are three different responses taken to this question of the differing roles that instinct and reason play in our lives. Firstly, with respect to the view that reason is greater than instinct, Descartes adopts this view. Nietzsche claims that Descartes recognised only the authority of reason, as he believed that instinct belonged purely to the realm of animals. Next, the view that reason and instinct play an equal role is taken by Plato and Socrates. Socrates believed that one must follow the instincts, but persuade reason to aid them with good arguments. And it was Plato's goal to prove to himself that reason and instinct move themselves towards one goal, towards the good, towards God. Plato believed that we ought to desire the truth, and mistakenly, according to Nietzsche, believes that this will make us good if we can come to know it. However, truth and goodness are not synonymous. The truth may be harmful to us and it is only a desire of ours for truth to equate to goodness. Here, instinct has triumphed over reason. And this brings us on to our final view that instinct plays a greater role than reason. This is the view taken by Nietzsche and we've spoken much more in previous videos about how Nietzsche thinks the unconscious and the instinctual parts of us play a much greater role in the formation of our habits, our beliefs and the decisions that we make than reason does. Because of this view, Nietzsche talks of the need for a moral psychologist. They would be valuable in that they would allow us to uncover the hidden factors that influence the formation of our moral beliefs. Next, Nietzsche writes about the desire for power and possession that is present within different structures in society. For example, Christianity's will to power is a possession of the other's soul in marriage. It is a complete unravelling of one's inner secrets. Another way in which the human craving for power is evident is in the parents' desire to control and construct their children into what they desire. Nietzsche writes, Parents involuntarily make of their child something similar to themselves. He states that, In former times, it seemed proper for fathers to possess power of life or death over the newborn and to use it as they thought fit. And goes on to say that, As formerly the father, so still today, the teacher, the class, the priest, the prince, unhesitatingly see in every new human being an opportunity for a new possession. Another important idea explored in this chapter is humanity succumbing to a herd morality. He writes, Human herds, family groups, communities, tribes, nations, states, churches, and always very many of who obey, compared with the very small number of those who command. So the passive action of obeying has become ingrained into us by the structures of society. This has caused the suppression of the development of the higher type of man, the free spirit, 
and the ubermensch that Nietzsche writes about. And these are the people that can create their own values. We as individuals and as a society have a herd instinct for obedience. The instinct grasps about wildly with little discrimination as a crude appetite and accepts whatever commander, parent, teacher, law, class prejudice, public opinion shouts in its ears. So it doesn't even entirely matter who they are obeying as long as it is someone. They don't care who it is they are obeying. They just need to satisfy this instinct to obey. Fear plays a very key role in the emergence and the maintaining of our herd instinct. Nietzsche writes, how much or how little that is dangerous to the community, dangerous to equality, resides in an opinion, in a condition or emotion, in a will, in a talent, that is now the moral perspective. Here again, fear is the mother of morality. The idea is that one fears what will destroy the structure of their lives and what one fears determines what they view as good and bad, which is their morality. They will favour that which preserves the structures that they value, such as community and equality, and will oppose that which threatens them. He even claims that love of one's neighbour is always something secondary, in part conventional and arbitrarily illusory, when compared with fear of one's neighbour. So herd morality and Christian morality are built upon fear, not on love. So because one comes to value the structure and stability of the herd, they learn to value mediocrity and timidity. Everything that opposes this model that they value is thought to be dangerous and evil. He writes in Aphorism 201, Lofty spiritual independence, the will to stand alone, great intelligence even, are felt to be dangerous. Everything that raises the individual above the herd and makes his neighbour quail is henceforth called evil. The fair, modest, obedient, self-effacing disposition, the mean and the average in desires, acquires moral names and honours. As we said at the beginning, people are too certain and close-minded about the nature of morality. They acknowledge only the value of the herd and of equality. With respect to the suppression of the higher, more special traits that are potential in man, Nietzsche writes, The total and instinctive hostility towards every form of society other than that of the autonomous herd, to the point of repudiating even the concepts of master and servant, at one in their tenacious opposition to every special claim, every special right and privilege. Nietzsche wants a return to the natural state of inequality, suffering and survival of the fittest. Finally, Nietzsche speaks about the role of the new philosopher in Aphorism 203. Their purpose is to revalue and reverse the eternal values that the herd has come up with. They will challenge the herd instinct that is so prevalent in society. They recognise that the collective degeneration of man to the perfect herd animal is dangerous in that it prevents the development of any higher type of man, of the ubermensch, and promotes the degeneration of man into a weak and sickly herd animal. The new philosopher ought to teach man the future of man as his will. This means that they will teach people that they are the ones who can create their own values, they should not be weak and adopt whatever values are given to them by society, which is the current situation that people find themselves in. Thank you very much for watching and be sure to like if you found the video useful and subscribe for more videos. See you next time on Feeling Philosophical and goodbye.